You know, we've been talking about prayer all morning, and I just believe that our worship is part of prayer. It is intercession in lyric. It is intercession in melody. And so when you worship, like you've been worshiping all morning, and we're going to just continue for another few minutes, because in just a second I'm going to ask you to stand back up and work your muscles a little bit more. But, but I just want you to understand when we worship, you are interceding. And the windows of heaven are opening up. And what an amazing testimony that, that he just gave us. Because I, actually all he did was obey and God did everything else. And that's where we need to get when we understand when things are impossible in the natural. When we obey God, they become all things become possible for the kingdom of heaven. So won't you start my track? And would you just stand back to your feet? Father, we thank you that your word is working in our lives, that we are not moved by the enemy's distractions. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy, in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Here come the angels. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm.
may be the only one that gets the vision to rebuild the wall in your life, to rebuild the wall in this church, to rebuild the wall in Ohio, to rebuild the wall in America. But if you are the only one that obeys, it'll be the beginning of a flood of God's glory. So I'm just encouraging you to find your own hallelujah, no matter what the enemy's trying to do, no matter what the enemy's saying, no matter what diagnosis may have come, you have a praise inside of you. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. Come on, build the wall of praise. We worship you. So Enemy, back off in the name of Jesus Christ, the name that destroys chaos, the name that dispels darkness. I raise a hallelujah. Barbie with a Bible. I like that. <laughs> I never heard that before. That's a good one. Mm -mm. Have you ever heard that before? Nope, and but you? it's a very good Barbie. Yeah. It what? may be old, but it was one of those made long ago. It's lot lasting. Forty years ago, I was Miss America. September the 8th, I will finish 40 years on the road as an evangelist. 40 years. It's interesting how... Um, how you get identified in your life. In, 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 that's one of the things we want to minister to uh, you about today. How many of you have heard us before? How many have not? Well, about halfway through the, the service, you'll get used to <laughs> one of us at least. I just want you to know. I, you know she's from Mississippi, and, and I'm from Michigan. You couldn't find two more different people to um, get together and, and marry. We only knew each other six weeks, and we, we eloped. We ran off and got married because it fit in our schedule at that time. I mean, you know, we have to schedule everything when you're on the road. I have one of those families. Yeah. But except if I'm from Mississippi, he's from Michigan, so our wedding would have been like, you know, uh, the Beverly Hillbillies meets the Godfather. So it's like, mm -hmm. I didn't say that. Too I, many did, guns. I didn't say that. And if Grandma, <laughs> if you're listening, I didn't say that, okay? I didn't. I still want to come down there and get wedding. cornbread and eat and everything else. So, but if you have your Bibles, let's start with the book of Genesis. We'll take you from Genesis to Revelation about identity. You know, if a, if a man, <clears throat> men and women are different. If a man meets another man, the first thing we do is we hold out our hand and we say, hello, hello, what's your name, what's your name? And then immediately we say, what do you do for a living? Is that not what we do? And that's about the end of the conversation because we got no more. That's about all you got. But, <clears throat> but you find your identity in what you do. And, and really, that's not the way we're supposed to go. We're identified by Christ. We need to find our identity in him. Who are you, not what do you do? But, what do you do is not your identity. Who are you? That's your identity. But people will mm -hmm. label you. People will help form an identity about you. And what and you go through in life may, uh, you have to be careful that what you go through in life does not become your identity. Harry and I could go through the list of what we've been through. I'm from Choctaw County, Mississippi, crippled from a car wreck, told I'd never walk again. If I allowed that, that would become my identity. Or um, 
become Miss America. That could become my identity. Or burying our daughter, that could have become our identity. Or having cancer four times, that could have become my identity. So you're, you see what I'm saying? You can't become identified by what you have gone through. That's just part of your life journey, but it is not your identity. Because if you own that, then you're going to stop wherever that was. And I would hate to think that I stopped 40 years ago when I became Miss America. I was only on the beginning. That was part of my destiny, but it's not my identity. For I am crucified with Christ. For I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. I think it's interesting that Pastor started the day about prayer because my new worship CD that I just sang number two off of is Teach Us How to Pray. The whole CD is about learning how to worship warfare. And so who would like this one? I want to give it to somebody this morning. Oh. Right here. Come, come and then it. this is my new book, and it's called Women of the Nation Pray. Also teaching us how to pray legally in the court of heaven so that we can understand we have legal rights to pray. And she's been doing the, those gatherings all across the United States, the Women of the Nation gatherings, and, and we've been doing the We Worship gatherings all over the United States. And then um, just recently, um, I, well, I guess maybe two or three maybe four years ago, started the School of Worship, and, and now we've, uh, we've got one coming up starting tomorrow in uh, Michigan. We'll be right. doing that. And so in our, in our senior years, um, we're now teaching more than, than I'm anything. I'm 62 and proud to be here. I'm thankful for every year. A couple more years, I'll be glad you're that much older than <laughs> me because we'll get that Social Security check. So... <clears throat> It's the insurance I'm happy about. <laughs> so open your Bibles to Genesis, the 32nd chapter, verse 24. And this is about the identity of a man named Jacob. Jacob um, had an identity that, that really was given to him at, at birth. And it wasn't the, of his choosing, but his mother got involved in his life at birth because it was at that point in time when she was trying to get him to steal the birthright of his brother. Well, I'm sorry, not at his birth, but as a young man. And so <clears throat> from a young age, he was marked, he was identified because of something that his mother tried to do. And, now, if, and if we're not careful, we will, we will take on the identity of our genetic code. And, and in all honesty, this guy could have taken on his genetic code and been pretty good about himself because his granddaddy was Abraham. You know. It was the birthright. So he, he could have said, hey, I'm, I'm born in the right family. I don't know about you, but I can't say that. I can't say I was born in the right family. I'm from Choctaw County, Mississippi. So I'm not like, I love my family. I love my parents. I love where I came from. But I can't say that's helped me get anywhere in life. It's only been the, the love of Jesus Christ in my life that's helped me get anywhere in life. And so this is what this third generation guy is figuring out too. Even though I have this great birthright in my life, I'm still having to find my identity in the Lord all by myself. And that's what he's doing. So let's pick it up at verse 24. It says, And Jacob found himself alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Now I want you to notice the word man is capitalized. That's very important. And when the man saw that he had not prevailed against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and Jacob's thigh was put out of joint as he was wrestling with him. Then he said, let me go for day is breaking. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you declare a blessing upon me. The man asked him, what is your name? And in shock, Jacob whispered, he said, I'm a schemer. I'm a swindler. I'm a trickster. Because he was ashamed of who he was, but he answered the man truthfully. And it goes on, it says, the man said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, schemer, trickster, but Israel, contender with God, for you've contended with and have power with God and with men, and you have prevailed. Jacob asked him, tell me, I pray, then what is your name? But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And thus the angel of God declared a blessing upon there. And Jacob called that name the place Peniel, or the face of God, saying, for I've seen God face to face, and my life is spared and not snatched away. And what happened was he had a face-to-face -face encounter with the man. And you have to understand, if there was a name you would capitalize, if it said Cheryl, it would be capitalized. If it said Harry, it was capitalized. But it just said man, and it said he. 
or even angel of the Lord, and all those are capitalized. So that means it's one of the Godhead. It's not an angel. You don't you don't Godhead or deity an angel. They're they're lower than we are in the class system. They serve us. And so in this case, when I, when the name is capitalized or he is capitalized or the word angel is capitalized, it means one of the son. It's either a son of God. It is God Himself, the Father, or it is the Holy Spirit. Well, we know God Himself could not have wrestled with Jacob because Jacob would have been dead from the moment he looked at him. You know, so and it's not the Holy Spirit because he's with us always now. Then he was with them. Now he's in us. That's what John tells us. But in this case, you can't wrestle with the Holy Spirit because you can't touch him. So he's wrestling with touching one of the Godhead. Which one of the Godhead is touchable? Jesus. Jesus. So here in Genesis is one of the first accounts. Well, it's not the first. It's one of the first accounts where we see Jesus manifested on the earth, and Jacob is wrestling with him. And why is he here? To help Jacob find out who he really is. You may be wrestling with your identity right now, but what you need to do is start wrestling with Jesus. For when you get face-to-face with God, you get to understand who you really are. Now, if you pick that up and you read that, he said, he began to wrestle with him. Daybreak was coming, and the man said to him, let me go. Jesus said, let me go. Let me go. Now, that's not something you want to hear Jesus say, is it? Let me go. Basically, what Jesus was saying to him, listen, we've danced around this subject a lot of times. I bet it wasn't there first. And you have not changed, so let me go. But Jacob said, this is a different moment. Because I'm not going to let you go, go until you bless me. And when you bless me, then I will have a change. It would be an outward expression of an inward change. I want to change my identity of who I am in you. Now, and this is coming from the ancient Hebrew. So the word bless in ancient Hebrew means put fire on the head. So what Jacob was saying was, I've tried to be a different man on my own. I've tried to be a different man being born in the right family. I've tried to be a different man in all these different ways. And many times we've danced this dance, but I've never changed. This is what we have in the American church. We have all these people who come to church, and they even say, I love Jesus, but they're not changed. And here you have a guy saying, I hate myself. I can't stand myself anymore. I'm I'm ashamed of who I am, and I'm dancing around one more dance, one more wrestling match with Jesus. I'm not turning you loose until you put fire on my head. When you put fire on my head, I'll be changed forever. Now, what happens here is, is Jesus says, okay, because you have contended with me, and you have got to the other side, and you're serious this time, I'm going to change you. But he said, I'm going to mark you. And Jacob said, the place of transformation for me, I call Peniel because I have had a face-to-face encounter. All of us can remember when we got born again. I know the moment. I know the place. I know the, the building. I, I, I remember the entire thing. And, and, and so you mark that in your mind. You can too. Absolutely. And, and I so, grew up in church. So don't tell me, well, I've been a Christian all my life. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. You're not a Christian until you have a life-changing, altering transformation of your heart. Now, do you, do you want? You said last night, Pastor, when you read our books on marriage, y'all just tell it the way it is. I worked for a major ministry in this country for ten years before I had a face-to-face encounter with God. Now, you might say, wait a minute, you ran a major ministry. Good man. Now, it, it, the, the thing I want you to understand is I believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, Absolutely. walked this earth as a man, crucified, dead and buried, and he died for my sins. Amen? But that's not having a personal relationship. The personal relationship said, when you become more of me than me, then I will have a transformation in my life, and the old person will be passed away. And the Bible says, it says, and when, 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 he, the, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he became a new man. A different man. And you know what no. you say? Well, I believe, but the devil believes. The Scripture believes. They, the, the, they believe the Scripture. Demons believe the Scripture, the Bible tells us. And what about the Scripture in John that says, we cast out demons in your name. We did these good works in your name. But Jesus said, I don't know you. You see, there's a difference in you knowing who Jesus is. He needs to know you. 
So now Jacob is there at this place, and the Lord touches him and touches him in the hollow of his thigh. And it says his thigh was, his hip was put out of joint. Now picture this, Jacob now walks into a restaurant, and he's walking through, and people look at Jacob's face and says, that's Jacob. Don't get do business yeah. with him. You don't want to be around that guy because he's a trick. He, he'll trick you. He'll cheat you. But then all of a sudden he's, he's got a little limp. And he's they say, that's different. Jacob, but he's walking different. He, he's carrying himself different. The countenance are different. See, when God touches you, you begin to transform and you carry yourself different. People don't walk up and go, I think you're a Christian. They walk up and say, he's a Christian. Because his countenance has changed, his walk has changed. We were, we were ministering down in Texas one time, and I was in the, after the service, and it was a, it was a very large church, and, and, um, and Cheryl and I were out front greeting uh, people, and, and the pastor was there. That's how they do it. And I'm standing there, uh, uh, standing there next to Cheryl and the, and the pastor, and this woman came up, and she began to poke me in my side like this. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm talking to someone, but I, you know, like your child walks up and, you know, daddy, 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 you know, and you this go, what? This was a stranger. <laughs> you know, but this person was just touching me, and I finally said, um, may I help you? And, and the woman said, no, um, um, but I came down here because, uh, do you remember me? And I go, ma'am, I don't have a clue who you are, and I don't know why you're poking me. <laughs> I mean, I'm like the Pillsbury Doughboy. I'm like, you know, and, and she said, I used to work for you. And she said, I had to come here, and she said, I had to see if you were real, because you're not the same man I used to know. Transformation. Now, this story Transformation. is very personal to me, because my walk became different, my talk became different, and people began to say, how can you have changed from the old person to the new? Never could have done it on my own. Jacob could have never done it on his own. But when Jesus touches you, People, people in your own family say, it's hard for me to believe who you are now because I remember you, what you did on Friday nights. I used to sleep in the same room with you. Yeah, but you just keep watching me. You're going to see my walk's different. People and that's watch what it's walk. all about. Your walk changes when you walk with God. Your walk. This is not about him being crippled. He wasn't crippling him. No. He was changing his walk. And every one of us should have a moment when our walk changes. He marked him. Move in your Bibles to the book of Daniel, the third chapter. Daniel, the third chapter. Um, we're going to start in verse 16, and I'm going to go kind of quick through this. So I want to make sure we get this all in. This is a story about the three Hebrew children. It says in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to answer the king Nebuchadnezzar, who had made a decree that if you don't bow, you're going to burn. And they said, it's not necessary for you, us to answer you on your question or this point. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from that burning fiery furnace, he'll deliver us out of your hands, king. But if not, let it be known to you that I will not serve your God, that we will not serve your gods, or worship the golden image which you set up. Nebuchadnezzar, upon hearing this, was full of fury. His face began to get uh, to change, and he was, he was, he was I mean, he's just rage. clenching his... It was the spirit of rage. And he said, how Same can... Thing that's, uh, that, that is the stronghold over America right now. It's a spirit of rage. It's not people. It's rage. How can he, how can they say this to me? And he said, he commanded that the furnace should be heated seven times hotter than it was usually heated. He said, I'm going to teach these boys a lesson. And then he said, get me the strongest men in the army and tie up these three Hebrew children and throw them into that furnace. The three men who were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their undergarments, their turbans, and their other clothing, and they were cast in the midst of this burning furnace. Now remember what bless means? fire on the head therefore because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot the flames and the sparks from that furnace killed those men who handed Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and these three men Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego fell down bound into the fiery furnace isn't that amazing now they're in the furnace now they're kneeling down they're not consumed but the ones who got close to the fire just throwing them in See, you don't have to deal with anybody who comes against you. God will deal with them. If, if because you're in of the fire heart. of God, the fire of God will deal with people. And then they're in the fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar saw this, and he was, uh, he was shocked. And he jumped up and he said to the counselors, didn't we cast three men burned into that fire? And they said, yes, we did. And he answers, behold, now I see four men, and they're loose. 
and they're walking in the midst of the fire. They're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like a son of gods. Now, he cannot understand who it is, but it has a form of one of the gods that he worships. And then Nebuchadnezzar came near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace. And he said to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the most high God. He's changing. Now, wait a minute. He thought it was a God, but now he's saying the most high God. One God. And here you got to pick this up, too. Why could Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be in the furnace? The people who threw him in were consumed, but Nebuchadnezzar gets the opportunity to look right in. Why wasn't he's not he burned? burned up. Now, he hasn't had a heart change, but sometimes when you stand, the transformation of other people are bigger than the people who put you in the situation you're in. This is about a nation. He goes on and he says, then Nebuchadnezzar came close to that. He says, you servants of the Most High, come on out of there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. The satraps, the deputies, the governors, the king's counselors, they all gathered around. And they saw these men that the fire had no power upon their bodies, nor was the hair on their head singed, neither were their garments scorched or changed or in color, nor had even the smell of smoke got on them. And Nebuchadnezzar said, bless be. The, now he's blessing them. He was so mad at him, he, he had, his face was furious. Rage. And now he's saying, I got to bless you guys. Now he goes from rage to fire on your head, fire on your head, fire on your head. He's blessing them who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who believed in, trusted in, and relied on him. See, there are three stages of believing. You believe, you stand. You trust when you're in the midst of it. And then when you come out of it, you rely on him. When Cheryl was, was, was crowned Miss America, when she was a little girl and she went in that car wreck and her left leg was crushed into 32, 32 pieces and a broken back and 100 stitches in her face, she had to trust God. Because she believed in God. And her prayer was, Lord. Give me anything and everything you want me to have. If you're a healer, I need healing. Because I had a vision from a milkman who was the prophet. And every Tuesday, Mr. Horton came to bring the milk we sold. And every Tuesday, the milkman would say, one day, little girl, you're going to be Miss America. One day, little girl, you're going to be Miss America. Be careful what you say to kids. They believe you. And God will use your words to bring a word, a nugget, a prophetic word that carries you through your trouble. If you let God speak to you, he'll use anybody to do it. And that little milkman spoke to me every week the same word. And until I was 11 years old and crippled from a car wreck and doctors stood around my bed and told me I'd never walk again, I didn't realize the power of those words. But when they stood around my bed and said, you'll never walk again, I said, no, I'm going to walk again. I'm going to be Miss America. Pastor because George's. I now began to profess and declare what the prophet had said. Now those prophetic words became my words. And Pastor and Jordan that's why talked I about a seed. What? Pastor Jordan talked about a seed. Absolutely. A seed can be financial, but a seed can be physical, but a seed can be something that you speak. He spoke that seed and it started to get inside of her and she began to believe and that seed began to grow up. But then she's sitting there in the hospital, all busted up. And she said, how can I walk the runway at Miss America? Unless God heals me. Therefore, God is going to heal me. Not too hard to connect those dots. God is going to heal me. Not man. Man did everything they could do. I was still going to be crippled for the rest of my life. But God... God is bigger than your circumstances. God is bigger than a diagnosis. God is bigger than the wall that you're having to face right now. Our God is bigger. A cocoon of calcium began to form around her leg, and, the, and they put her in a body cast, and after uh, many months, they stood her up, took the body cast off, and they said she's a miracle because the bone in her left leg was stronger than any other bone in her body. Now, the situation was she had a short leg, and, and, and the, the interesting thing is, well, God doesn't stop halfway. She found a group of ladies in, the, in town. Six years later now. You now don't, get up, don't get upset because you had to wait a little bit. Now, remember, she's walking with a limp. That's why I love the story of her Jacob, because I walked with a limp, but my life was changed. Her mama hemmed her pant leg shorter on one side, so it didn't look like she was so out of balance. 
And one day, these group of ladies, they said, there's a man named Kenneth Hagan, and he's preaching in a town called Jackson. Why don't we all get in the car and drive a couple of hours up there? Two Methodists, two Baptists, and two Presbyterians. You, and you, me. You never know your part in a miracle. So the next thing you know, she gets in the car. They drive up there, and he says, if anybody needs healing, come on forward. She walks forward thinking she's the only person up there. The next thing she knows, there's a whole line. I didn't care. They could come if they want to, but this miracle's mine. And that's why you've got to declare when you go before God that people can get and come and get what they want to, but this is yours and my time, and I'm going to get what I came for. You sang it in the song today. There was one, and there's 99 others. But you have to be the one. And she had a prayer. Lord, give me anything and everything that you have for me. And immediately, her leg grew up. And you might say, that's hard to believe. It's hard for a lot of people to believe. I don't care if you believe it. I'm not telling it to try to convince you. I'm but telling you what happened. It's up to you to believe. But we're thankful that the doctor who'd done the surgery on her and everything else was still alive. And he said, I can't explain it. And he wrote a miracle across to her chart. Years later, when people questioned it, she went on national television. Remember on Larry King? She's talking about her miracle. They got the doctor on the phone. They said, can you validate this? He says, I can't validate anything other than she was crippled, and now she's not. I declare her a miracle. So, so you get Mark, why? He was my doctor when the leg grew out. He was my doctor when the bone was formed. He was my doctor. And so when Larry King got him on the phone, he said, all I can tell you is she was crippled and was never going to walk again, and God put a bone where there was no bone. She had a short leg for six years. I had just done a physical on her, and she comes back from Jackson, and she's got two legs the same length. He said, all I can tell you is that girl's a miracle. Now, remember, sometimes your miracle is bigger than you are because that spread all over the country. It's one of the reasons we're probably here today, because of her testimony for 40 years. We're going to conclude with this last little scripture here in the book of John. Turn your Bible to the book of John. And it's uh, the third chapter. Let's see, John 2. two. And uh, it, it, the story is about a wedding at Canaan, and, 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 and Jesus and his mama were there. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding at Canaan of Galilee, and the mama of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited with his disciples to the wedding. And when the wine was all gone, the mama of Jesus said to him, they have no more wine. Jesus said to her, woman, <laughs> I'd say that to my mom, I'd get popped. What is it to you and me? What have we in common? Leave it to me, my time, my hour, or my ministry has not yet begun. His mother didn't hear him. She turns to the servants. He said, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. He wasn't disrespecting her when he called her woman. She was changing positions. She had been known as his mother for 30 years. But she was changing positions. And he realized when she changed positions, he would too. And that's why he resisted. Sometimes other people around us change positions and it makes us uncomfortable because we are going to be forced to have to make a decision ourselves. Am I willing to be changed because I'm hanging with them? And Jesus was saying, hey, it's not my time yet. It's not my time yet. And she didn't even pay him any mind because she knows. you got to figure out what you really know. What do you know from God? Not what you've heard, not what pastors taught you, but what do you know? What do you get when you get in the face of God? What do you know that you know that you know that you know that no man, no circumstance, no situation, no devil in hell, no diagnosis can talk you out of? What do you know? See, now Mary knew something. At the age of 14, when the angel appeared to her, he said, one day, little girl, you're going to get pregnant, and the next thing you know, you're going to give birth to the Messiah. He'll be great. He'll be imminent. He will have a reign without end. All of and that prophetic word, but it wasn't true for her until she said, be it unto me, even as you have said, activated. See, God can send you a thousand words for the rest of your life. But until you decide to say what God is saying, until you decide to declare the truth of God that's been implanted in you, then it stops being just a seed and it begins to grow and cultivate and comes out into the form of truth in your life. Listen, it's time you stop just hearing it and it's time that you start speaking it. So Mary hears it, she begins to declare it, and she said, but if I go back home and I'm 14 years old and I'm pregnant and I'm not married, I'm going to have a problem. So I'm going to go to my cousin Elizabeth's house because my cousin Elizabeth is in the midst of her own miracle and I need to be around other people who are going to encourage me and that's why I'm you come to I'm going to hang church. with miracles. 
You come to church, church to be around other people. When God gives you a word, he'll say, I believe the word that God's given you. Not saying, I remember you when you were a little kid, and you couldn't, you shouldn't, you wouldn't, you won't. So Mary hears from, uh, she goes to Elizabeth's house, and then an angel finishes saying to her, said, but Mary, I need to tell you everything about your baby boy. There'll be a day. Don't come after him. You're going to beat him. You won't even recognize him. But before that, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, the blind will see. But now we, but 30 years later, Mary kept this all quiet. Now she got up that morning and she felt different. You get up some morning, you feel different. She gets up and she says, today's the day. She goes in and she's introduced as the mother of Jesus. Because that's been her position at that point. But then Jesus says, woman, he wasn't being rude. He said, woman of God, because you've stepped from being my mother to the woman of God who has been told this day would come. And you see, if she'd have been still holding on to being the mother, no mother would have ever put him to that cross with the knowledge of what they were going to do to him. But a woman of God would say, I need a Messiah more than the world needs my son. I need a Savior. And she says, whatever he tells you to do, he begins his miracle ministry by turning the water into wine. But don't ever think Mary stopped being her son, and don't ever think that he didn't forsake his mama, because at the cross, the very last thing he did was he made provision for his mama. Remember, he said, this is your mother, this is your son. He didn't, he didn't forget his mother. I need Messiah more than but I God didn't forget the woman of God. You want to know something? There's only a handful of times that Mary's mentioned in the Bible. But boy, did she play an important I role when she spoke the God. words. Whatever he tells you to do, more you do I it. Whatever God tells you to do, do it. There's a question I love to ask people. What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Change me if you don't try, you failed. If you try and it doesn't work out, you haven't failed because you stepped out. You stepped out on faith. And how do you know what you did today doesn't activate something down the road? Because look what Mary did. She stepped out on faith, and 30 years later, look who was activated. Join hands with somebody today as we close. We're out of time. I just ask you. People walk up to you and you say, I'm identified by my job, or I'm identified by my title, or you identified by something that you did. People's culture on Miss America, but her greatest title is she's a woman of God. I want to share this last story, and I am out of time, but my wife and I went to a shoe store, clothing store one day, and as we went in, um, she wanted to buy me a pair of shoes for my birthday, and we came out, and on the, on the wall, it had a sign that was just written in hand. It said, a clergy gets 10 or 15% off. And so Cheryl walked up, and she said, we're not really clergy. We're ministers. And, and the girl said, oh, I want to bless you with that. We said, thank you very much. And she said, she was going to tell him what we did. And the woman said, besides, I know who you are. And so I walked up hearing that, and I thought, oh, it's a young lady. She probably knows her as Miss America. Maybe she's seen her on her, her daily TV show or something at that time. And then I walked up, and she said, I know who you are, and I've never been in a pageant in my life. And she looked at me, and our daughter's name was Gabrielle, and she said, you're Gabrielle's mom and dad. I said, excuse me. She said, oh, I followed you and watched for all those months as you prayed and believed for your little daughter. I prayed for her. And she said, I'm a better person for her. Cheryl and I got in the car. We had our shoes. And I sat down, and this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, weren't you blessed that you were known by the works of your daughter? And all of a sudden, he said, do you know how blessed I am as a father when you do the works of my son? You're going to be the milkman in somebody's life. Amen. Father, I thank you right now that if anybody's heard this and they've been struggling with who they are or whose they are, that today they know that they have royal blood running through their veins, that they're a king's kid, 
that the Lord has set them high on a mountain. But we have to accept who we are in Christ. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today's your day. But if you have and all of a sudden life has beaten you down, you find your place like Jacob. And you say, I'm not going to leave this place until the Lord touches me and I have a transformation. When I walk out of here, I'm going to be a new creature in Christ. Today's your day. If you want me to pray for you to either receive him for the first time or to rededicate your life, squeeze the hand of the person on your left or your right that you're holding. By doing that, the Bible says it's an outward expression, an inward change. You're just telling somebody to your left or right that I'm going to pray this prayer to them. Squeeze them. Now, with no one looking around, no one moving around, you need to take the second step. If someone squeezed your hand, hold on to that hand and do me one favor. Just slip it in the air right now with your hand so I can see it. Why do I ask you to do that? I see your hands. Because the moment that you moved up to him, he moved down to you. In a few moments, he'll be inside of you. If you think I was going to embarrass you, I'm not. You want to be included in this prayer, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to slip your hand up. 9, 8, Here's 7, 6. Hand. Thank you. 5, Here's 4, 3, 2. You Forever may lower your hands. And let's pray this prayer. You. Some people call it the sinner's prayer. Some Here people call it the, a prayer of dedication. I just say it's the prayer that you say, Lord, take me just like I am. I am. So let's everybody out in this house pray this prayer if we could today. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Today. Today. I declare. I declare. That you. That you are Lord of my life. Are Lord of my life. I'll never be the same. I will never be the same. I'm marked. I'm marked. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm on my way to heaven. I deny hell. I deny hell. Because you now. Because you now. Are Lord of my life. Are Lord of my life. You prayed that. You believe that the living Jesus, God is inside of you. He's changed you. And now Jesus, we're going to see you walk Lord. out the walk of faith. Jesus' name. Jesus Amen. changed my life. Amen. Come on, let's give a big hand to Cheryl and Harry Salem. If you'll just continue playing, you're doing a great job.